Thank you, Marilyn. Do keep your Bibles open to Exodus chapter 7 to 10. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, all of Exodus 7 to 10 today, and we'll be flipping around a little bit. Uh, but there's just a snippet of these plagues. Uh, but let's open our time in prayer uh, to the Lord. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we often ask for justice in the world, but then we shudder when we see your judgment on display in the Bible. And so today, as we turn to Exodus chapters 7 to 10, help us to understand the purpose of the plagues you brought onto Egypt. Help us to see you as victorious and Help us to see you as bringing both judgment and salvation, and that this demands a response. And we pray that the ultimate result of our reading of your word today would be that we would praise your glorious name. Amen. So, a number of years ago, when our oldest son was just a toddler, so we're talking about 10 years ago, Uh, My wife and I uh, went to a church outreach event for uh, parents and tots. Uh, It was a monthly deal, uh, similar to what a lot of churches run. Uh, And and so there was a few crafts and coffee and tea uh, and a little Bible talk at the end. And and each month, uh, they would tackle a different part of the Bible. Uh, And on this particular month, the theme of the afternoon was the ten plagues from Exodus. And to be honest, it was a bit of a surreal experience. Uh, One of the crafts was a collage where the kiddos would cut out pictures from newspapers of natural disasters and paste them onto a poster. Then there was a station uh, for face painting where cherub-like three-year-olds were being transformed into Egyptians, complete with painted boils on their faces. Over in the corner, there was a a red river of finger paint that was constructing a Nile uh, turned to blood. And and my lasting memory of the whole day was a very remarkably graphic puppet show. Uh, To be honest, uh, despite my best efforts to get stuck in, at that point I felt like there was a fundamental disconnect between the oversimplified afternoon of preschool plagues and what God had actually done in Egypt to redeem his people from his enemies. And as we continue in our series in Exodus this morning, I think that we could easily be in danger of a similar fundamental miscommunication. Because right now, the world is battling an epic plague. And there's a real danger that by looking at this passage this morning, we could either make connections between what was going on in Exodus and our situation today that are not valid, or alternatively, we could shy away from really digging into this part of Exodus because right now, uh, this touches a nerve uh, with what's going on in the world today. But also, I think that we need to be careful because uh, this part of the Bible raises lots of questions, particularly uh, about the situation that we're in right now. You know, questions like, what's, what's going on in these plagues? How do we make sense of the kind of destruction that seems to be coming from God in the Bible? And how does this sobering series of episodes relate to us today? Now, as a, a guide of where we're going this morning, uh, today we're going to be looking at the first nine plagues, uh, which are documented in Scripture in Exodus chapters 7 uh, to 10. And, and then next week, we're going to examine the 10th plague, uh, along with uh, the exodus of God's people from Egypt. Uh, but today, for the sake of time, uh, we're, we've just read the summary introduction that's right at the very beginning of chapter 7. Uh, and then we are, we are going to look and dip into chapters uh, 7 to 10 as a whole. Um, uh, and it, it, already we've looked at the plague of hail uh, from chapter 9 so that you get a flavor for it. Uh, I'd encourage you, over the course of this week, set aside a half hour uh, and just read all four chapters uh, in your own time. I mean, we've all got extra time this week, uh, and so we can have a bit more time of reading. Uh, so you should be able to do that. Uh, but as we, as we dive in here, it's worth noting at this point uh, that these nine plagues are organized in three cycles of three plagues each. Uh, 
And each of these cycles of plagues begins with Moses warning Pharaoh in the morning. And each cycle ends with a plague that occurs without any warning at all. And, and you, know, you don't even have to have a really close reading of this text to get the idea that, that this is a progressive and escalating uh, affair where God's power and his judgment in these signs is growing as you go from plague to plague. And as a map of where we're going today, Exodus chapter 7 verses 1 to 6 provides a summary of the themes that are developed throughout all of the chapters. And we'll see that the first theme that's developed that covers the kind of first cycle of plagues is that God battled Pharaoh for authority. The second theme we'll see, which is taken up in the second cycle of plagues, is that God judged Egypt and saved his people through these plagues. And finally, we will see that God is glorified throughout the world through his total command of the Egyptians. So now that we've got a little bit of a road map of where we're going, uh, let's just camp out in chapter 7 to 10, starting with verses 1 to 3 of chapter 7, which says this. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like a god to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You, you shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. In the first three verses of chapter 7, we can see that God established Moses as his agent. Moses was like a god in a battle. Moses was going to be God's agent in a battle against Pharaoh, and it was a battle for authority. So, for instance, in verse 1, Moses was set up like a god to Pharaoh. In verse 2, Moses was commanded to challenge Pharaoh. And in verse 3, we are told that Pharaoh's heart was totally hardened to God. Pharaoh was an enemy who would not become a friend. And this is one of the big themes of Exodus uh, chapter 7 to 10, that the plagues are like a battle. God is battling Pharaoh, who stubbornly pretends that he is a god. The plagues are a battle for who's truly God. Because if you'll recall uh, from last week, the Egyptian pharaohs, they claimed that they were gods. And they also claimed to have a whole host of other gods at their disposal. And most of these deities were rooted in the prosperity that came uh, with Egypt's cultivation of the Nile River. Okay, And so there was, they, had, they had a god of the sun because the sun helps us with crops. They had other gods, all different types of gods, all connected with their prosperity. And so the Egyptian gods were primarily worshipped with the hope that they would bring Egypt wealth and stability and power. And the Egyptian priests, or magicians as they're called here, would solicit help from these gods uh, through divination and through magic. And they would try to get these gods to do what they wanted. But the Bible says that Yahweh, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob is the only true God. And therefore, what's taking place in the, in the plagues is a battle between the true God of the universe, Yahweh, and the false gods of Egypt, which is important to understand because when we read about these plagues, it's easier to, easy to see them only as vehicles for judgment. But one of their primary purposes was to establish God's victory over those who would claim his authority. And, and this battle for who's more powerful it is the central theme of the first cycle of plagues, the plague of blood, the plague of frogs, and the plague of gnats. Look with me to chapter 7, uh, skipping down to verse 16, where God instructs Moses to go to Pharaoh, and he says this to him. He says, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you've not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall be turned into blood. 
In this opening plague, God strikes at the heart of Egyptian power. God turns the water of the Nile and her tributaries into blood. And in doing so, transportation, food, communications, infrastructure, everything froze. It crippled Egypt. Because everything in Egypt relied on the Nile River. And while this had to be devastating for Egypt, it's interesting to look at Pharaoh's reaction. Look down at verse 22 with me. Look at, look at Pharaoh's reaction. Verse 22, it says, But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. It's interesting. You would think that Pharaoh would want to get rid of the plague. Um, you know, it was probably just destroying his people. You'd think he'd want to get rid of it as quickly as possible. But in verse 22, it says that Pharaoh is most concerned with replicating the plague. Verse 22 says that Pharaoh commissioned his magicians to conjure up the same sign as a demonstration of his power. Pharaoh's concern was not to clean up this environmental nightmare, but to match God, power for power. And the same thing takes place in the second plague. Aaron, Moses' brother, calls forth a plague of frogs. And in chapter 8, verse 7, it says that the magicians did the same thing by their secret arts. They also made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. you got to ask yourself, why would Pharaoh want more frogs? The answer is that this was a battle. What was going on here was not primarily an act of God's judgment, but a battle between Yahweh, the true God of the universe, and Egypt's false gods. And in this battle, Egypt doesn't have a chance. Because as we fast forward to chapter 8, verse 17, Aaron calls forth gnats from the dust. And then in verse 18, it says that when the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, they could not do it. The Egyptians were finally out of their depth. They couldn't repeat the sign because they were up against the God of creation. And from this point on, the battle against Pharaoh becomes a determined victory. Pharaoh's magicians are no match for God. In all of the remaining plagues, the battle is over. God, the creator of the universe, wreaks havoc and chaos to the creative order that the Egyptians assumed that their gods maintained. In every plague, God would strip the Egyptians of the common blessings that God provided to all of humanity at creation in order to show that he is the only Lord. That idolatry is always a losing hand. And this is instructive to us. Because when you read this on the face of things, it might seem absurd that Pharaoh would willingly go up against God. I mean, it's not a battle to pick, is it? You know, it's, it's, it'd be like in school, going up to the biggest kid in school and punching him in the nose just to see what happens. It's just not a wise thing to do. And to continue to do it and to continue to cling to those idols, even when they were clearly failing him, you go, what are you doing, Pharaoh? But actually, in many ways, we are just as susceptible to practicing idolatry. Now, sure, we don't worship the sun or the Nile. But here in the West, we live in the most powerful and privileged time and place in history. You know, and, and a month ago, if you were to walk into any modern Western city, cities like London or Paris or New York or Rome, you, you could easily fall into the trap of thinking that we, we don't need God anymore. You know, we've, we are gods. We can do whatever we want. Because we have finance and political and cultural and academic and art, artistic and medical and scientific resources right here at our fingertips. We don't need God. We we have everything we need. And and for many of us, those things actually became functional gods for us. We relied on money and influence and good health and freedom. We assumed that they were ours to command. Which is why for many of us, 
God wasn't even in the running for our attention. But now, all those things that we, we treated as functional gods, they're now at risk. They're much more fragile than we imagined. Now, don't get me wrong. All those things can be really good things. They just aren't very good gods. Because they don't last. They don't stand up to the test. They don't ultimately satisfy Which is why when we make an idol out of the good gifts that God gives us, we will inevitably be disappointed when they fail to live up to our expectations. But by contrast, God is matchless. He is the source of life and every good gift. He is the creator and the sustainer of the world that we live in. And unlike our idols, he never fails. He is always victorious. And he will never let us down. The central theme of the first cycle of plagues in Exodus is that God is victorious over his enemies. And this points us to Jesus' ultimate victory over his and our greatest enemies. Over Satan, sin, and death. At the cross, Jesus defeated Satan, sin, and death. Because at the cross, he died and took away our sin. He overcame death. And he defeated our greatest enemy, the devil, Satan himself. Jesus is the Lord who is always victorious. And he gives us the spoils of his victory. He gives us freedom from sin. He gives us eternal life, freedom from death. And he vanquishes evil so that we'll be no more. And this should give a Christian confidence in a world where functional idols are failing at every single turn. Because right now, many people are realizing that the the functional idols that they put their trust in aren't working. And as a result, many people right now are much, much more open to having a conversation about God. And as we come to those conversations, we need to trust that God is victorious. We need to trust that as hard as it is to believe, the coronavirus is not our biggest enemy. Our biggest enemy is Satan, sin, and death. And Jesus has already defeated all three. Which is why we should turn to him in faith, letting go of the functional idols in our lives. Because unlike those idols of this world, God is always faithful and true. He never fails. The plagues are a demonstration of God's victory over his enemies. But also, God is using the plagues for the twofold purpose of judgment and salvation. Let's turn back to chapter 7 to verse 4, where God says this, I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. Here God describes a twofold activity. God will both judge Pharaoh and he will save his people through these plagues. The plagues have two equal and opposite goals, judgment and salvation. And this idea that God is judging Egypt while at the same time saving Israel comes into its own in the second cycle of plagues, in the plagues of flies, livestock, and boils. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 8, starting at verse 22 again. Here we see that Moses is warning Pharaoh that the houses of the Egyptians will be full of flies, but that on that day, God would deal differently with the land of Goshen. Goshen was where the, where the Hebrews lived. And so you've got all of Egypt that's going to be covered in flies, but there's this one little refuge, Goshen, no flies. And the reason for that is because God was judging his enemies whilst at the same time saving his people. God made a distinction. And he made that distinction so that Pharaoh would know that the Lord is in the land. He is there, present. A distinction was made between God's people and God's enemies. 
And the result is stark. Israel enjoys protection from the judging hand of God. Goshen would be this place of refuge. But verse 24 demonstrates that throughout Egypt, the land was just ruined by these flies. And this same distinction is made in the plague of livestock, the very next plague. In chapter 9, verse 4, it says that nothing of all that belongs to the people of Israel shall die. The Israelites were safe. And I love what it says around the plague of boils. It's just a wonderful note of irony that Moses makes sure to tell us in verse 11. In verse 11 of chapter 9, Moses makes sure to tell us that the Egyptians, even the magicians, were covered in boils. And they couldn't even protect themselves. You remember those magicians who back in chapter 7 stood so proud? Well, now in chapter 9, they're under the hand of God's judgment. And this pattern of distinguishing between the Egyptians and the Israelites continues with a good amount of regularity into the final plagues. God targets his judgment against the Egyptians while at the same time guarding his people from judgment. Now listen, I get it. At this point, it might be a bit uncomfortable and we might be tempted to be uncomfortable about the whole idea of God's judgment. I mean, this is all pretty graphic stuff, isn't it? I mean, we don't often think about this God, what, about God this way, you know, boils and all the rest. But, but what's going on here is both judgment and salvation. Because, sure, the plagues are a horrible judgment if, if you're an Egyptian. But for the Hebrew, this was an answer to prayer, a supreme mercy. Because remember, the Egyptians had persecuted the Hebrews mercilessly. And Pharaoh, their king, was actively defying the Lord of the universe. If you were a Hebrew, you would have been cheering God on. You would have been like, finally! Because God was finally bringing justice and salvation to his people. But today, we are less comfortable with the idea that God is good and fair in his judgments. We resist the idea that God, who is perfect, ought to be our judge. And yet it's interesting, uh, as a society, we generally submit to the idea of morally imperfect judges judging us. You know, human judges, the ones, you know, with white wigs and black uh, gowns. We're quite happy for imperfect humans uh, to both reward and punish people in courts of law, in courts of judgment. Which makes me think that maybe what makes us uncomfortable with the idea of God judging us is that we, humanity, know that we might fall under God's judgment. Because even the best of us would be a bit uncomfortable with the idea of our lives being on display and judged. I mean, think about it. Imagine if all of a sudden the screen that you're watching right now all of a sudden turned into your life, your whole life on display. And the images we saw were the things that you did. And the words that we heard were the words that come out of your mouth. And the thoughts uh, of your head were just running as a subtitle underneath. Would you be happy with the whole world watching that? I know I wouldn't be. Because none of us are perfect. All of us have done things that we deeply regret. We've said things that we wish we could take back and we know we can. we thought things that we dare not even mention. All of us have rebelled against God thousands of times in our lives. And the Bible says that our treasonous behavior towards God, who is perfect, deserves judgment. That's why we don't like the idea of God being our judge. But the big question before us right now is how will we, un- how will we respond to this uncomfortable Truthful news. For some of us, like Pharaoh, we'll harden in our rebellion against God. It's way easier to say, who do you think you are? You big dumb American. Who do you think you are? You you don't know me. You can't judge me. You're right, I can't. I'd fall under God's judgment in a heartbeat. It's way easier, though, to point the finger out and go, who are you? Who do you know? Than to honestly reflect on 
what deep down we all know to be true. For others of us, we'll just try to ignore the uncomfortable truth uh, that our rebellion against God deserves judgment. We'll just ignore the warnings. You know? We'll put our heads in the sand. We'll ignore the warnings, like the coronavirus. As we keep on eating and drinking and scrolling on Facebook and just doing all the things that we do right up to the day when our lives end and we meet our maker and our judge. But there are some of us who know that we fall short of God's standard. And we know that God is just to judge us. And while it's not comfortable, we know that facing the truth is better than living in open rebellion or denial. If you're part of that third category, can I urge you to turn to God with a humble and broken spirit, asking Him for mercy? Because the very good news is that when we turn to Christ in faith and seek out His mercy, He will provide us shelter from God's just and righteous judgment. Like Goshen was for the Hebrews, Jesus is a refuge from judgment. At the cross, Jesus took all of God's judgment onto Himself, and He offers mercy and salvation to all who put their faith in Him. And right now, If you don't have the assurance that comes from putting your faith in Christ, from turning to His work on the cross, I want to appeal to you. Don't wait. It's a dangerous situation for someone who delays submitting to God's rule in their life. Because with God, there's only two options. Salvation and judgment. And God's offer of salvation is... It demands a response. God has not made space for fence sitters. So don't linger with a hardened heart. For that hard heart could become a part of your judgment if you're not careful. Many scholars have noted that Pharaoh's hard heart was both hardened by himself and also hardened by God. They note that at the beginning of the plagues, it was Pharaoh who hardened his own heart. But by the end, it was God who hardened Pharaoh's heart. And what's being communicated through this shift is that our disbelief, our hard-hearted resistance to God can start off as an expression of our own self-determination. I decide who I am. I am my own God. I'll do whatever I want. But that over time, it can become an instrument of judgment against us. Where we become so hardened that we're incapable of turning to God in faith. Which is why right now is the very best opportunity in the world to turn to Christ in faith. Literally everything's been cleared from our decks, hasn't it? If now isn't the time, when is? Can I encourage you, seek shelter in Christ today while there still is time. Because with God, there's only two options. Salvation and judgment. So far, we've seen that God used the plagues to battle his enemies and to declare victory over them, and that God used the plagues for judgment and salvation. And finally, we will see that God also used plagues for his glory. Turn back with me to chapter 7, verse 5, where God says this to Moses. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. In verse 5, God reveals that one of the goals of the plagues is that Egypt will know that that God is the Lord. And this theme surfaces throughout the plague. So for instance, in Exodus chapter 7, verse 17, it says, By this you will know that I am the Lord. In Exodus chapter 8, verse 10, it says, You may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. In Exodus chapter 8, verse 19, the magicians, they even exclaim, This is the finger of God. They they even admit God's at work. Exodus chapter 8, verse 22, You will know that I am the Lord. I'm in this land. This phrase, you will know that I'm the Lord, runs through the text like an undercurrent. And it surges up in the plague of hails at the beginning of the third cycle of plagues in chapter 9, verses 14 to 16. 
Let's read together, starting at verse 14, where God commands Moses to say to Pharaoh this, For this time I will send all my plagues on you yourself and on your servants and on your people. Why? So that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence and you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose I've raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. It's interesting. You know, God could have just wiped out the Egyptians, couldn't he? It would have been a lot tighter than the ten plagues thing. But Egypt's, Egypt's judgment was mediated by these plagues so that God's power and his name might be proclaimed in all of the earth. God's purpose in the plagues was to assert his authority over Egypt, to judge Egypt and to provide salvation for Israel, but also God's ultimate purpose was concerning his own glory. It's interesting, throughout the plagues, you know, Pharaoh offers Moses all these compromises. In fact, he offers four compromises. So first in chapter 8, verse 25, Pharaoh says to Moses, Okay, Moses, uh, you can sacrifice uh, to God in Egypt. You, you can't go to the mountain of God. You just have to stay in Egypt. And then in chapter 8, verse 28, Moses, or Pharaoh offers, he says, Okay, well, the, Egypt, or the Israelites, they can go from Egypt, but just not too far. And then in chapter 10, verses 7 to 10, uh, Pharaoh says, okay, well, you can go, but only the men. They're the only ones who are allowed to go. And then finally, in chapter 10, verses 24 and 20 to 26, Pharaoh gives in. He says, okay, everyone can go, but you've got to leave your livestock. You can't take your stuff with you. But Moses never takes the bait. He never compromises. Because God's goal was not to compromise with Egypt, but to command her. For God, Egypt was never really a true threat, but rather Egypt was an instrument by which God would make his name great. And next week we will see that God's glory will climax with, with Israel's deliverance from Egypt, a deliverance through which other nations would know that there's no God like Yahweh. Now, at this point I have a confession to make. When I shared earlier about the plague-themed children's outreach that my wife and I attended some years ago, part of the disconnect that I experienced on that day was that I was uncomfortable with the idea that the plagues might be used in a community outreach setting. Uh, in my mind, I thought, what would a non-Christian coming to this event think? You know, face-painted boils on toddlers. It's a bit off-putting, isn't it? In my mind, I decided that the plagues don't make great PR for God. But actually, that's not my determination to make. Because it's clear that God intended that this account of His victory over His enemies, of His judgment and His salvation, would stand as a testament, proclaiming to the world that there is no one like God on earth. God's goal with the plagues is that we would read this and we would marvel at his power. That we would read this and we would glorify his name. That we would read this and it would have us drop to our knees. And part of being faithful to God is to resist the urge to repackage him in an attempt to make him more palatable to the people around us. But instead, a faithful Christian receives him as he reveals himself in Scripture. And a faithful Christian rejoices in him, in his mighty works of power. We need to be humble enough to see that God is bigger and working in larger dimensions than the box we might allow him to, to live in. God is praiseworthy for his victory over his enemies. God is glorified in his judgment of Egypt, and he doesn't need us to smooth out the complexities of this re reality. Instead, we're called to marvel at how great he is. We're called to praise God as he is in all of his glory. 
And the reason why we can do this in full, without being naive or without resorting to triumphalism, is because what God did in Exodus points us to and is fulfilled in what he did in his son, Jesus Christ. Christ went to battle against God's greatest enemy, Satan. Satan is relentlessly in pursuit of us. He would love to enslave us through worldliness. He'd love to accuse us because of our sin. He'd love to defeat us and discourage us. Satan would love to set up shop and pretend that he's God. But Christ defeated sin on the cross. He declared victory over death at the resurrection. And right now he reigns at the right hand of his Father. And one day he will return to bring the full scope of his judgment against Satan, his greatest enemy. And he'll bring that judgment on anyone who does oppose him. And on that day, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Lord. He will receive glory forever and ever. And this is good news. That Christ is victorious in his judgment is very good news for us right now. Because when we face illness and heartbreak and disappointment in this world, which sadly it looks like many of us will do in the near future, those of us who have put our faith in Christ can be confident that he rose from the dead. We can be confident that that his promises of a whole new creation where sin will no longer have the upper hand in our lives, where death will be a distant memory, where God will be forever glorified is a reality because of what he's already accomplished at the cross. And as we close, if you know this hope because you've put your faith in Christ, I would encourage you to praise God unapologetically praise God as he reveals himself in Scripture. Go out of your way to share with others that God has defeated Satan, sin, and death forever. Proclaim the good news, the gospel, which includes the truth about judgment, but also includes the wonderful good news of salvation. Find opportunities to praise God and to share how he saved you. And then look forward to the day when all nations will gather together as one people of God to marvel at and glorify the name and the power of God. Because God is victorious. He is both a righteous judge and a gracious Savior. And he redeemed us to worship him in uh, in all of his glories forever and ever. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, through the plagues you brought down on Egypt, you have proclaimed your victory over your enemies. You've brought both judgment and salvation, and you've brought glory to your name. And we're told clearly in the Bible that Exodus points us to Christ. Christ is our victor who defeated Satan, sin, and death forever. Christ is our judge and Savior who calls us to turn to him and to flee from judgment. And Christ is forever our King who will reign on high as our glorious Savior who redeemed us for worship. Help us to turn to him in faith. It's in his name we pray. Amen.